Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to As I Live and Grieve. Our guest today is Cindy Mish, and we are delighted to have her. I, oh, I'm i going to say I discovered her. It makes me sound like an agent or something, but I'm going <laughs> to say I discovered her on Facebook, I believe it was, when she was talking in a group. She was talking about a project she had started that is what I would call a legacy to the memory of her husband. Cindy, this is very recent for you, and we so appreciate you coming and joining us today. But before I go too far, would you please just give our listeners a little bit of your background? Sure. Um, I am currently almost 53 years old this year, and most of my life has found me being a uh, a writer. Uh, So I've been a professional writer slash award-winning journalist for the last 25 years or so. Um, I have published various books. I've started my own magazine. Um, I became a filmmaker probably two years ago, and I've been running my own film festival for the last six years. Um, And well, actually, we had two film festivals. Michael and I had one and I have one. Um, So basically, I do just about anything that allows me to write, period. Cindy, if if we have established nothing else with our podcast, it's the fact that everyone grieves differently. That I believe to the, in the to the bottom of my heart that I personally am going to grieve for the rest of my life, and I think that applies to many people, especially when you've lost someone that you've been as close to as a spouse. And well, we all just wish we could just. Well, get over it, because that's sometimes what our friends tell us. Can't you just get over it? That's an impossibility. So we keep trying to move forward just to get through it. As I said before, Cindy, your loss is recent. Are you comfortable telling us just a little bit about your husband? Sure. Um, uh, Do you mean on the personal side of things or, or how he ended up where he is now? Well, I like to say, just tell me about your husband, because... I never met him. Well, Michael, uh, Michael was probably the most infuriating, inspirational, (laughs) frustrating, (laughs) stubborn, creative, uh, uh, colorful, humorous person you'd ever want to meet. I met him almost four years ago in New York. Um, As I mentioned, I run a film festival and he had a director that submitted a project to me. And I liked his work so much that I reached out to him on Facebook. I told him, you know, how much I liked him. And then he blew me off for a week. And then I heard back from him and I said, you know, I'm I'm taking a trip to New York. I'm shooting a film. And he, he sent me a lovely note saying, you know, if there's room for me, blah, blah, blah. Loveliest note I had gotten from an actor in quite a while. Long story short, we met um, at a place called Madame X in the village in New York City, and I was interested in another guy, wasn't interested in Michael at all, didn't even know he existed. I was pretty much like, <laughs> he's my buddy, I'm meeting him for the first time. Well, said uh, said thing didn't really work out with the other actor that night, um, and Michael stayed, and that led to uh, a wonderful evening there and at Washington Street Diner, and then to the subway at 7 a.m., um, you know, and... Uh, that led to, you know, what would become the greatest love of my life. Um, you know, he, he was one of the best professional indie actors I've ever seen. And I don't say that because I love him. I say that because so many others say it, um, Mm -hmm. his body of work, even though it's 43 films, I believe was just extraordinary. I mean, he could effectuate emotion. He could get your attention. Um, but you know, he's also a Dago. So, you know, he was never wrong. He was very stubborn. (laughs) He didn't matter what he and he would drive me up the wall. Um, he's probably the most mature relationship I have ever had in, in my life, um, you know. And then, uh, yeah, things were chugging along, and it took me six months to fall in love with him. Took him a lot longer. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, a little over a year ago, he got sick. Um, mm-hmm. He was losing weight, and I thought something was wrong. And he was pretty convinced it was cancer, and I was pretty convinced it wasn't. Um well, he was right. Um, and I don't say that often. 
uh, May 11th, uh, he got his diagnosis, stage four large B-cell lymphoma. Ugh. And then probably four, maybe five months later, they said, you now have stomach cancer. And uh, then he had a heart attack in November. And then he spent 12 days in the ICU. And then uh, he passed on December 2nd. Mm. My goodness. Sometimes in telling the stories, and I know it's difficult to tell, my husband's been gone four years. Sometimes it's difficult to talk about him. But then again, sometimes in talking about it, when we take a deep breath, we find it's really just what we needed to do. Because the more we vocalize it, I believe, gets a little more comfortable each time. Just a little bit more comfortable. Hmm. That being said, as I mentioned, when I read a paragraph that you had written in Facebook, you intrigued me completely. Because, and I didn't know your background. But you mentioned that you were doing a film tour. Yes. In memory of your husband. So yes. I want to switch focus now to this project. <laughs> okay. Can you, can you tell us about the project? It sounds sure. fascinating. Okay, so it is called uh, the True Looks of Love Tour because I, if you ask Cindy, what does true look of love look like? Well, I would say my children first. And then, of course, I would say Michael. Um, you know, so one of the things that irritated him, and I will tell you this, this is pretty standard in the independent industry. Most people, I think, are used to the Johnny Depp's of the world and all the other right. elements. You know, Indy's a whole nother demon, so to speak. So one of the things that irritated Michael so much was that he did all these projects and that we'd run into people and I would fawn all over him. And I would say, oh, he's a professional actor. And I would boast about it to the point where he would say, don't tell people I'm an actor anymore. And I'm like, why? And he, he would say, because they're going to ask me, where do I find my work? And then there's like two places. Cause you know, most of the film work, most of the time it would go through a film festival or a festival circuit. And then it mm -hmm. would just not end up anywhere. And so he was really yeah. discouraged. So, it was very important to me. If Michael were here right now, I think one of the most important things to him, period, was that he be seen. And most importantly, by new eyes. You know, there's always a fear of, like a lot of his friends, etc. You know, the sympathy vote, so to speak. It's extremely important to me that people that don't know him or first knew him, etc., are the, are the main audiences for these screenings. Because... They're seeing it because it's Michael. They're not seeing it because he had cancer or he got sick or they mm -hmm. love him. Mm -hmm. You know, so new eyes are very important. And so uh, I sat down one day and thought about, well, what do I need? Selfishly, um, as much as my friends at home try, I think people are poor with grief. They don't, they think you need space and they think you need all these things you don't. So what I did was figure out 12 states where I had really good friends and I said, I'm going to hit the road. And why? Because A, if I need support there and, you know, I have friends in every state or we right. have. Right. Number two, he has a total of 43 different projects. So I calculated it out to where if I did 12 different states or 12 or 13, and I did so many at each, I would end up having a total of 52 screenings because he, he passed at age 52. Okay. So, you know, what's exciting for me is the ability to screen all of these different projects, to be able to have a, a lot of the directors are participating. So we'll do Q&A, that sort of good stuff. Plus, I get a chance to actually, you know, I can sell the movies if I want. At the end of the tour, they're going to go and be distributed. So anybody who couldn't go see them live mm -hmm. will be able to actually watch them. So I'd like to think that he would be so delighted that, oh, look at this. Everybody's watching Michael and it's not just the Mish, as he called me. <laughs> him it would be everybody you know so um i owe him i owe him that and so much more but it, it sounds amazing it's what a fascinating project uh and i can't imagine how much work uh, it is but for someone with your background me you know I, i'm sure you you've got it all figured out uh actually no i don't have a figure out <laughs> But this is what happens. You'll be like, okay, I work with a lot of publicists and a lot of people. But the thing is, if you knew Michael and I collectively, like my film festival is never done at a theater because everyone does them at theaters. That's just the thing. So I've done them in halls. I've done them at restaurants. I've done them in bars, galleries, hotels. So every place is different. You know, like, you know, New York, obviously he was from Long Island originally. So I'm okay. sure we'll go to Long Island, find a location, you know, so Dallas is going to be a little bit different. One of them is a barn, 
you know, so they're unique. Each one of the locations mm-hmm. is unique. Plus you need Wi-Fi, et cetera, because you've got, you know, people all right. over the place. So it is a huge undertaking, but, you know, I mean, I don't need an excuse to watch his work. I mean, let's face it. I sit here and watch it now when I can and make no mistake. Yeah. I used to watch it all the time. Now it's very hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sure. have to, you know, that sort of thing. I'm also sure. excited because I was told uh, he has two films that no one has seen yet. They're what? actually done this year. So I have one of them, but I'm just too afraid to watch it yet. Uh. I, mean, I just can't. <laughs> it's just kind of yeah. sitting there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the tour should be exciting. And plus, too, a lot of these different movies are, are just, you know, they're just really neat, very well-made productions from student films to other things. Even There's a play in there. So it'll be neat. Once your project is complete, Cindy, what are your plans for it? You mentioned a little bit. Well, um, I'd like to distribute the work more so because I do realize that they are senior citizens, people out of country, people that can't get to them. We were big believers in live anything. So for us to do live screenings is very important. Um, so getting that work distributed, you know, is important. Uh, we shot two films together. I don't know what I'm going to do with those. I mean, my first inclination was to burn the footage oh. um, because... It's just very difficult to think mm-hmm. about the, you know, people don't realize when you do a movie, it doesn't just end there. In the independent world, unlike the studio films, you have to promote them. And then I have to sure. talk about them. And then I have to interview about them. So here I'm going to have to talk about this over and over and over right. and over again. And that can be very challenging. Sure. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, we had a t-shirt line together. So I'm sure I'm probably going to sell off the t-shirt line because that's got to be done. I do... Uh, I had written a play for him. I'm not sure if I'll even go through with that or not because it was written for him. We talked about a, there's a screenplay I have the rights to, the Bram Stoker's Dracula um, that was done by Bella Lugosi. I have the rights to put that on. Oh. Well, I'm thinking about recruiting all of Michael's friends, who a lot of them are actors, and just seeing if they could put the production on and as an homage to him. I, I'm very mixed about that because Michael is to play Dracula. So... Mm. There's always the yin and yang of, I have to, I walk a very thin line of wondering if I'm offending the person I love so much because the, I, I don't want to replace him. That's the problem. There's no replacing him. Right. Right. Um, And there is no other him. So, you know, I have a lot to think about there. Plus I had a full career before I met Michael. So I've kind of put the whole career on hold for the last year. And I, and honestly, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, this, this loss for you is pretty recent. You know, you need to take some time for yourself and make decisions that you need to make right now. Leave some of the decisions until a time that you're more comfortable Mm -hmm. making them. You know, you'll find that way. You'll find that way. Yeah. I think eventually something will feel right and you'll know Mm -hmm. that it's what you need to do or not need Mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. And I, and I think, as you mentioned, you know, if you were going to do something as an homage to him, I I think that would be very fitting. And I don't know how he would help but be honored by it. Well, he would probably say, as he sits here right now, he would say, no fuss. He was not a big fan of me fussing. I'd fuss over him all the time. And he'd be like, I don't know what you're fussing over. <laughs> um, so he would probably laugh and say, my God, she just can't help herself. Because, you know, he used to think it was adorable that I fawned all over him, yeah. which, you know, was very deserving. Um, I guess my feeling is, is that for those of us that have lost a loved one, and I hear this from a lot of widows and other people, I've been waiting for him to tell me what to do. Um, I talk to him a lot, probably more than I should. And, and he's in my head all of the time and, and I'm waiting for him to answer me. I am going to see a medium in the near future. My Good. hope is that she can get us to be in the same room at the same time mm-hmm. or, you know, just to get some answers. Cause you know, he was my best friend. I don't, yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now without him. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there is no roadmap. There is no single book or work in any medium that will tell you this is what you need to do as grieving you have to find your way yourself by things that move you by things that you feel drawn to and uh, again i have had some things well for example this podcast just kind of put in front of me (laughs) and and i I knew with with no doubt this is what i need to do Mm -hmm. so It'll happen. 
Yeah. It'll happen. But it'll happen probably when you're receptive to mm-hmm. it happening. So, I, yep. yeah, we, and we've we've had um, several mediums on our podcast and they've been uh-huh. very interesting. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So, in, in fact, one of our recent guests, you might just be interested in grabbing his book. His book was, is called Love Dad. Hmm. Um, okay. And he talks about how his father died and then things kind of happened. So now he's in through a medium he's in almost what seems like constant communication with his yeah. dad wow and he, he actually wow. has been in plays too yeah oh, my gosh look at that well you know i mean he was never a big fan of mediums but I'm like i'm kind of running out of options if you knew michael well enough you would already know i mean yeah he would always used to say everything's on the list so it wouldn't shock me at all that it would take him six months to answer me. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm not shocked by this whole sort of let's just have her wait and all that good stuff. So we'll see. I, I do know what you mean as far as waiting for I got a sign the other day. So there are two things that I can't talk about because I've decided I'm not anybody. But I am filming two different uh, sets of interviews that will be a television series. And these are things that I, I know that he would probably put his blessing on. Excellent. So I'm excited yeah. about that. Go ahead. Excellent. Cindy, as you go through your grief journey, do you find that this work that you're doing is helping you at all go through it? Or what challenges are you presented with as you try to go forward? I think a lot of us have the same sort of things. I can tell you that by nature, I am just a very hyper person to begin with. So my mind goes a thousand miles a minute. Now my issue is I just can't stay focused. Like Mm -hmm. when I'm really into something, then I'll stay focused, but it takes a lot of concentration. I get very easily distracted. I cry, uh, you know, on command sometimes and sometimes Mm -hmm. out of nowhere. Um, Today was a particularly hard day for certain places I had to go. So that makes it harder. Mm -hmm. Um, Work is okay, but the reality is I know this is probably a poor way to put it, but there's no way to put it. Um, you know, I just don't care. I mean, and, and I know I should. This would this this would this element right here would disappoint him more than anything because I chose to give up everything. I chose to say I don't care. I said I'm gonna go to Walmart and work. I'm gonna give up everything and just go be a Walmart checkout person. And then my friends are like, Is this what you what he wants? To which my retort is, Well, I guess if I guess if he wants me to do something different, have him show up or have him call me, yeah. which I already know he can. So I think work can be helpful. I think that um, I think it's definitely the tour will definitely be more of an impact because there are people who will hold my hand and let me cry right. or scream or do whatever. I, I think it's probably more helpful having the support aspect of it. Work to me right now is like, I mean, I'm a writer. I mean, can you imagine trying to write like this? It's not simple and I'm not doing And it sucks and it's like frustrating. What insight can you offer others as it relates to creating the legacy, one that may be viewed or offered to generations to come? Well, I think that anyone's life is a legacy, to be honest with you. I think if you love someone enough, um, they kind of live through you. I mean, before he left, he would tell you that I was a I was a supreme advocate to the point of yelling at nurses, doctors. I made my opinions very, I mean, I was in their face like you're not, I was his voice, period. Um, I knew more about everything than he did. And I did that on purpose. Um, So now he's not here. So who do you think the voice is now? I think that the the greatest legacy you could offer someone is not forgetting them and making other people remember them. Cause I post them every day and I share things every day and I refuse to let people forget it. I'm sure they're sick of it. And my retort is, well, move on then, you know, my life, my choice. Uh, he, if he, if you knew him, you would know he's too wonderful to not know. So I feel that I owe him that, but, but as it relates to a legacy, I think that any person's life is that, but you do have a responsibility. I think, to some degree, to just make sure that that they're remembered and remembered in such a way that you remember them, you know, or a way that you know that they'd want to be remembered. Like if you knew certain things about them, I think most people when they leave want to leave an impact. And I fear that Michael left so soon that he wasn't able to really fully impact people with his work as much as he could have, which is where I step in. Right. And you will keep his memory and his name alive. Right. I hope so. With what I you're do. doing. Yeah. yeah. I do. I hope so. Do you think this project will lead to a secondary one, like another component of the legacy? Well, 
here's the thing. Some of his dear friends, in fact, one in particular had said to me, it's all fine and good to do this, you know, and, and of course, there's no one who doesn't like this idea or support it. Well, except probably his family. But um, <laughs> there's something to be said about his comment to me, which was he said, at some point, you're living for Cindy, right? I mean, all of this, to some extent, is just to keep me closer to him, which mm -hmm. I mean, might sound silly to people, but how mm -hmm. else do you stay close to him? Well, if right. I'm constantly... You know, if you're surrounded by, oh, I have to do this for Michael, or this is about Michael, it's all, I mean, let's get real. It's been about Michael for four years. Um, so why would it be any different now? But he's probably right. At some point, I have to do something for me. Um, and this is for me, obviously, but not to the fullest extent. I'm sure at some point I'll transition into something else, but I'm sure that no matter what I do, he'll always be some part of it. It doesn't matter what it is right. that I do which would make moving on hard. Yeah. And I was just going to point out to you, Cindy, and then you realized it yourself that what you're doing may seemingly be for him, but it's for you. It's what you need to do right now. It's what gives Cindy some comfort, some peace right now. No one else is going to walk your exact journey of grief. Everybody's is different and you can only do the things that give you comfort. I said shortly after my Tom died, I said to Stephanie, in fact, this is weird because I gave up everything while he was ill. I, I gave up everything to take care of him, to advocate like you did. I was also a fierce advocate. So I understand all that. But, but after he died, I just all of a sudden I realized it was so obvious how much of my daily routine, my personal lifestyle that I had given up to take care of him, to take him for lab work, for blood work, for chemo, for everything. And I said to Stephanie, I said, I feel like I have to redefine myself. Well, here I am four years later. Do I still think of Tom? Yeah, every day. Every day there's something. And if I see a bottle of hot sauce in particular, that makes me smile because Tom loved his hot sauce. Do I cry? Not every day. But yeah, there's days after four years. That's why I say I'm going to grieve for the rest of my life. But I have, to a huge extent, redefined my life. My grief is still a part of that life. It's just I've kind of wrapped my new life around it. And carried sure. it with me. I've just adapted. And I think everybody will do that. Mm -hmm. But it's on your own timeline. Right. Sure. With whatever support you have. And you may not even realize it. And then all of a sudden, one day, it will come to you. Oh, I just kind of did that for me. <laughs> you know? And it'll happen. As I say, it's, it's still pretty fresh for you. Sure. Our time is winding down. We'd like to keep our episodes to about the half hour mark. So I, we want to offer you a little bit of time before we wrap up here at the end. If there's anything you want to uh, offer our listeners, if you have a website, if you have, you mentioned radio, I, I don't know if you have your own podcast, anything you might want to direct our listeners to, um, this is your chance to speak directly to our audience. Go ahead. Okay, so let me see here. I think, uh, well, I'd be more inclined to tell you how to find him, to be honest. So I guess he's probably the easier one. Um, so the, the man that I've been speaking about, if you Google him, his first name is Michael. Uh, the last name is Gent, well, Gentile, G-E-N-T-I-L-E. -E. Um, so if you type in that name with an IMDb, um, don't confuse him because there is another producer who got himself in a bunch of trouble. That's not him. <laughs> um, if you look at your IMDb, you're going to see all those different things. If you look up, um, I want to say it's truelooksoflovetour.weebly.com, but the name of the tour itself is called True Looks of Love Tour. If you type that in with his name, you're going okay. to find um, the entire website, and I've laid it out where you can see a biography about him. You can find out about the shirt line. You can read about his different films. He did videography. He did photography, etc. So you'll see all of that on there, along with a list of all the different uh, 12 or 13 states that I'm going to and the dates involved there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he's on IMDb. He does have a YouTube. So if you go on there, you can see his reel and a few other different things. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I mentioned, I owned up until I just did the last issue in April because I just don't have the heart um, to continue with my magazine. It's called The Art is Alive magazine. Mm -hmm. So if you just type in 
the art is alive magazine.com, you will see, um, the entire issue. You will see his pretty face because he's my last cover. Um, you'll hear the story, the whole tragic story of how he passed is in there, etc. And it's wonderful. I mean, artists, authors, musicians, you name it, it's in there. So that's the art is alive magazine.com. If you type in Art is Alive Film Festival, you will find my website, and that's my film festival, which is going into its sixth year this year. Um, that's taking place in November. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be New York or New York and L.A. I haven't decided yet. But that's taking place in November, um, and that will be a total of 55 films in five days, I think, this year. Wow. And tribute screen or five tribute screenings, five special screenings too. So that goes on in November. I decided to do that because, well, I kind of got guilted into it. So that will be in its sixth year as far as that goes. The radio, if you want to see so far, I've done 350 episodes. Um, type in sins. It's C I N apostrophe S sins chat corner.com. You'll see all the various shows I've done. Um, I just announced that I am going back to radio at some point in June um, starting once a week, which is a far decline from what I was at. Um, but women in mourning, just, I'm just not there yet. So definitely look uh, for that. And then of course I am filming literally right smack dab in the middle of filming a, a series, a six part interview series on, um, what I call human hearts of the Holocaust. So I'm interviewing Holocaust uh, survivors and descendants both. Um, so I don't have a website up for that yet. And then I have two other series that I'll be filming after that, which I just can't talk about yet. Um, my name is Cindy and the last name is M I C H and I'm apparently everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, you know, I'm everywhere. So, um, and that's, I'm not thrilled about that, but that's what happens when you're, you know, a media personality and or journalist, um, you know, that's pretty much everywhere that you can find me everywhere that you can find him. Um, yeah, but for now, I mean, it's hard to find me. I'm very quiet. I don't do these very often because I'm, I'm still very, uh, I'm just still very unhappy yet. Still mourning. Well, you know, your own timeline. I, I firmly believe that. Don't let anybody try to tell you differently. Don't let mm-hmm. anyone try to move you along too quickly. It's all up to you. You're in the driver's seat. So for our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed listening as we've chatted with Cindy. My entire focus for this was really about legacy and about the quote that I've mentioned several times, and I guess I really should look it up and see who said it, but it's for as long as you speak their name, they will never die. And we owe it to the people we love that have passed. We owe it to them to keep their memory alive in whatever fashion we can, whether we utter it to ourselves every day, whether we put it on Facebook, whether we send Twitter, I don't care how you do it, but whatever opportunity you get, speak their name, tell a memory, write down a memory. We talk about journaling a lot too. And you know, you know what I'm going to say next. If you're grieving, well, even if you're not, it's important to take care of yourself. Just like when you're on the airplane and they say, if those oxygen masks drop from the ceiling, put yours on first, because if you don't do that, you can't help anyone else. So whatever little thing you can do in the name of self-care, do it this week. And then we hope, we hope that you'll join us again next week as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.